learn some insider knowledge that will help you overcome and strategize in the cutthroat world of real estate. Now, here are your hosts, John and Roberto. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Burrows and Burbs, season four. I believe this is at what episode one of season four, episode one twenty. I'm your host, John Engel, in New Canaan, Connecticut. I'm joined by my co-host, Roberto Cabrera. I'm on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Thanks for being here. All right. And uh, each Thursday, we bring you a conversation about the national real estate, sometimes the international real estate market, generally the luxury real estate market, because that's what interests us and New Yorkers. We're exploring the boroughs, the burbs. This week, we're back to the burbs, the burbs, Manhattan. We're going to talk about Brooklyn. Queens is uh, on the rise. Uh, we don't talk much about Staten Island, do we, uh, Roberto, or the Bronx? No. No? We okay. haven't gotten to Long Island either. So we're going to do a New York market report. We're going to get Jonathan Miller from Miller Samuel. Uh, he's been a regular contributor on the show. And um, I think he's having difficulty connecting. But when he join, he'll join us mid-show. Uh, first, I want to uh, thank our sponsor, Grace Farms Foods, if, or you can visit them at gracefarms.org website. Learn more about their mission, their Design for Freedom initiative, and you can buy their teal. This is chamomile, citrus, caffeine-free herbal tea. This is my tea of choice. You can give this as a gift. That's what I do. I drink the chamomile citrus, and then I give it as a closing gift when I sell a big house. That being said, let's just dive right into it, Roberto. I wrote a promotion for this show saying that um, the sentiment was optimistic, that we were experiencing record prices in New York and that um, they were expected to go higher. And I think you and Jonathan said, wait a minute, wait a minute. We didn't say anything about record prices. Um, and, you know, no, we, we and you said you've got to temper. You got to temper how you introduce this. Nobody is talking about record prices in Manhattan. Um, that might be true in the burbs where you're experiencing record prices, record low inventory. Uh, but we've got a lot of inventory right now. We've got a mixed market. We are optimistic, but we're not in record territory. So. How did I get it wrong, Roberto? What is the situation now in Manhattan? Well, let's to go. Let's go back. So, from 2019, we were at a certain level. We hit 2020. So, 2020 was, which is I find 2020 to be almost like a metaphor of where we are right now. Where we are now is being a metaphor of where we were at the very beginning of 2020 in January. We were so optimistic. We had just come off of probably five years of the market slowly deflating like a balloon, just very slowly the air coming out and the volume had been slowing and slowing and, and pricing had been just kind of floating downward, downward. There was one blip uh, in June of 2019, I believe it was, where there was um, a, a, law that was passed that everybody rushed to buy really quickly at the end at the end of june right before a deadline but besides that everything had been floating away from us at the beginning of 2020 there was a turn and we were starting to everybody's out this is going to be the most amazing year and it started and it started running very good and then of course we got covid and it destroyed everything and then of course everything went all the way down at the end of at the end of uh 2020 and then as 2021 came in the, by mid-year, it was crazy. 2021 and 2022 were crazy years and the market really started to escalate. At the beginning of 2022, if you remember, you, war in Ukraine happened. Interest rates started to started their rise. Everything, all it started to spook the market and everybody started to come off the market. And we have slowly had that same deal volume contract, 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 contract. And that has brought price that has softened prices the whole way up until where we are right now. The only reason why prices have even remained 
moderately flat and not gone down is because inventory has been so tight, so tight and has contracted. And that has happened because sellers don't want to sell in this environment where the interest rates are so high. For one reason, they don't want to sell into an environment where buyers are, are hesitant to jump in because interest rates are so high. But at the same time, those sellers also become buyers. They sell their properties. They've got to buy in an environment that is so high with where the interest rates are so super high because those, again, those sellers become buyers and they're going to be, and if they sell, most of these people have 3% mortgages, some of them for 30 years, some of them for a lot less, which is where we're starting to start to see some cracks in inventory starting to come on. But we're just now at the same, that same feeling that I had personally at the beginning of 2020 is that this is about to change. Interest rates are starting to moderate. If anything, they came down a little bit at the end of December. Right now, they come up a little bit, but the general thought is that we have peaked on interest rates and that they're gonna start to come down. And it is allowing and it's prompting a lot of sellers and everybody to now start to open the door to coming on the market and getting out to buy. So prices have not hit record levels. We could in this coming year, as if the volume starts to track as much as I as we're hoping it does. But a lot of that's gonna depend over the next couple of weeks. Right now, I think is an extremely amazing window of opportunity for anybody who's really mature as a buyer in the marketplace, someone who's seen a lot, someone understands what's out there because the marketplace still hasn't generated, it hasn't picked up. It's after the holidays. The typical cycle is that after the holidays, people are just waiting to get their feet back on the ground, get back in, get their kids to school, et cetera, et cetera. And then the latter part of this month, people start getting out to look at property. Wall Street gets their bonuses. People understand what they have, to, what their budgets are, and people start looking. And this year, with interest rates starting to come down, that's going to start to track. Offers are going to come out. Deals are going to start to happen, et cetera. Right now, for the next three, four, five weeks is an amazing window for all buyers, in my opinion. What I heard you say was there's a great deal of seasonality in the market. Uh, that hasn't changed. Um, what I've also heard, and we're going to come back to that seasonality and whether there's less seasonality in the market or more. And what we're seeing in the suburbs as a result of a lack of inventory is uh, less seasonality, there's more opportunism in a tight market. So I'd like to understand seasonality, number one. I'd also like to understand uh, your pro the, the fact that you say interest rates are going to have a profound effect on sentiment in Manhattan. Um, I think that we've known for quite some time that interest rates were going to peak uh, at eight. Uh, they've already come down to, say, seven or high sixes, and they're expected to continue to come down. Um, the change in the last few months has been it might take longer uh, to come down, but everybody, I think most of the Fed governors expect the interest rates will come down and settle in the uh, mid to low fives eventually. But nobody expects that to happen for at least six months or a year. Um, the Fed is already stating they won't even begin lowering interest rates until maybe May. So Let's just start with those two questions. One, seasonality, and then two, why you believe interest rates are having such a profound effect on the New York market. Well, tip, the typical seasonality of just going through the year is that beginning, very slow January until the end, people start getting out to look at properties, people make an offer on something and they lose it to someone else. And then they make another offer on something else. They lose it to two or three others. The market starts to get much busier. It gets extremely busy. This is a typical, over the last 20 years, this would be a, an average cycle. February, March get extremely busy. Then there's a couple of spring breaks that happen where people breaks up some of the momentum, but the momentum continues through April into May, starts to slowly drop in June, July, August, August being one of the slowest times of the year, hands down. And then the fall becomes a very short market whereby depending upon where Labor Day is early or late, wherever the Jewish holidays are, 
whether they're early or late, tend to be a speed bump in the process and the momentum of the marketplace. And you have a very short window in the fall, which is really six, seven, eight weeks. Because once you start hitting November and Thanksgiving, people just, they check out until that January. And again, you're looking at December and early January, which become like the second slowest time of the year. So that's the general cycle. That's the seasonality of New York. Right now, we're in the low part. We've had almost now two years of deal volume that has contracted. There is a certain level of demand in New York that is constant. It is always there. It has been stunted. It is getting pent up. And people want to move. There are so many people who want to move. I showed properties to people last year, and they were like, I love this place. The guy I remember is a guy I had two bedroom apartment, three kids. And he, I showed him a four bedroom apartment. He's like, this is amazing. I just, I cannot give up my interest rate. And he was locked in at a certain point. There starts to be cracks because people can hold on to that for a little while, but after a while, life has to move on. You have that older kid now really needs his own room. You know, that other kid, you know, that kid, got into school across town, you have to move, you got a new job, someone gets divorced, they're all the life circumstances. There's cracks happening now where people just- What I want to know is, I want to understand though, what's changed? And and we've always had seasonality. And you've always said that your biggest problem in New York is the competition, right? That's a quote that you you bring in your market report, you know, all the time, that the biggest challenge you have is once you find something great in New York, there's probably 10 other- hundred other people looking at the same thing. And if it's a good property and it's a good deal, you're going to lose it. And what I hear you saying is there's without uh, a change in interest rates and without um, any other external change, people are not experiencing in New York the sense of urgency that would cause them to say, you know what, I'm going to get, I'm going to be looking during the Christmas holidays. I'm going to be looking during the, this, the, the spring break, the summer break. Out here in Connecticut, I can assure you, and in Palm Beach, I can assure you, they're looking 24-7, 365 because of a lack of, because of a lack of inventory. So what you're saying is there's no lack of inventory driving the New York market, but historically it wasn't a lack of inventory. It was the fact that even when you had abundant inventory, you had competition. Is the ta- competition gone? There's always competition and there is low inventory in relative terms. Like we don't have, we have much more inventory to them. Sure. Palm beach has than you have. There's ton, there's tons of properties out there. Just a lot of them are stale. They're old and they're not exciting. Anything. I'm going to pull up the- a screen while you're talking. Mm-hmm. And, and okay. so we can actually look at what that means. Anything. So, anything here's a Manhattan rental inventory. And I see it looks kind of the same at that four that just under four thousand was above five was five thousand for most right for most of yeah, the but year. Slide all dip- the way, slide away all the way over to the left part of that chart. Look right. where inventory is. It's at a much higher place. Right. Okay. So, but the point, if anything comes on the market and it's special and it's really nice, it's renovated, it's one of a kind, it disappears, and it will have a bidding war. That'll happen no matter what. And that is always the case. Even in COVID that happened. Okay. The only thing is that some of those things weren't coming on the market when COVID was going on. Mm -hmm. The fact is, is it's all relative right now. Is that John? Um, um, This is Jonathan Miller. I'm I'm finally in on the phone. (laughs) All right. Welcome, John. What a 35 minutes of trying to log in on Zoom. I use Zoom three times a day at least. And you guys are creating problems for me. That's all there is to it. <laughs> it's John. It's John Engel's problem. Yes. <laughs> all right. Roberto just made there's a little bit of feedback on your on your phone. Uh, I've, got uh, like, I've got like three microphones. All right. How's that? That's better. That's better. Roberto just Good talked grief. about seasonality in the market. No, it's too much feedback. <laughs> All right, how about that? How about that? Nope. Nope. Crack going. 
out. I don't know what to do. <laughs> so um That's better. You sound good that's now. Better. Yeah. Roberto just talked about two important factors affecting Sorry. the New York market. How about now? Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. I can hear you. Yeah. Talk to me briefly about seasonality and how much of a factor interest rates are on the 2024 New York market and the sense of optimism? So the way to think of, uh, first of all, I apologize to everybody in your audience. This has just been a technical nightmare. Um, but uh, so let me, let me sort of step back just a second to answer the interest rate question. So, um, you know, we had talked about, I think the last time we spoke that uh, you know, the outlook was rates are going to be lower um, in 2024, and obviously that has proved the case, and, and the Fed paused in December. Um, rates have fallen about a percent without the Fed doing anything. Their next action is going to be a cut. So what that conveys to the market is that rates over the next year are going to fall and um, and possibly fall further another bunch of rate cuts in 2025. So this narrative of, um, you know, forever rising rates has ended. And now people are starting to do the math just before, you know, the spring market hits in a few months. Um, so I anticipate um, more volume uh, this year, but not a frenzy, not a boom. And the logic behind why I think rates are probably going to go further or uh, fall further, which is going to have a sort of oversized reaction in the market is largely because, you know, there's a 2%. I, I, I can't remember if I've said this to you in the past, but the whole idea is the 10 year treasuries and the 30 year fix is a, is a one and a half to 2% spread. If, you know, treasuries tenure is uh, below 4%, but let's just call it four. That means, the 30-year fixed on the high end should be 6%, and it's, you know, in the, it's like 6.6 .6 right now. Um, so rates can actually slide further without the Fed doing anything, but the Fed is going to do something. They've already said it. So I think that you're going to see rates uh, below the, the six handle um, by the middle of the year. And I think that's enough to start really bringing people in. The other... The other thing to think about is this idea that, um, you know, how do we get more inventory on the market? And, and this is a national condition. Manhattan is much less so. Inventory levels right now in Manhattan are just a hair above long-term averages or long-term levels, um, whereas in the suburbs, Westchester just hit a 40-year low. Um, uh, so it's very different in the city. So if you had to be a real estate broker or agent anywhere in the country, Manhattan is probably the best position because there's product on the market. Uh, I'm not saying it's properly priced, but I'm just saying that there's more product on the market than any other market that I can think of at the moment. Anyway, I don't know if that answered your question. Interest, <laughs> this, this change, changes in interest rates is not a surprise and it's not a dramatic change and it's not happening like any minute. The Fed has signaled that we're, you know, they've been looking for soft landing. They've been talking about only a few cuts this year, maybe beginning in May. Nobody expects the interest rate environment to change dramatically in 2024. So why would that have an impact on buyer's sense of urgency or a seller's sense of urgency or willingness to deal in New York? Interest rates, I don't think, are much of a factor in the New York market. Yes, they are. Uh, I, can, I, was hope, I, I, I was hoping I was hoping you'd say that. Go ahead, Roberto. <laughs> I personally, I, I think, look, there's an, a tremendous emotional component and psychological component that happens. Right now, the increase, which has just been just so steep, has now paused. And there's the, uh, there's the notion that they're going to come down, not immediately, 
but this is a long-term process. People are now going to start to get out, kick the tires, see what's on the market, learn the process. In doing so, you go as a buyer, you go to an open house, open houses are going to start to be populated. And they're, that what happens is it starts to get into your psyche of you, there, you are, there's competition. And you start being a little bit aggressive and you start, and then it just starts to build on itself. And then a couple of deals start happening. The deal volume starts to increase a bit. And then New York is notorious for FOMO, where the moment people feel that they're missing out, they jump in and it starts to accelerate itself. So that's good. There's, and I do agree with John. I don't think it's going to be something, I don't think it's going to be an explosion but I think there's going to be a serious momentum shift where people are now identifying this is the circumstance. They're not going any higher. If anything, they might get better. Let me start to try to secure a property because I can always refinance in the future. Um, I was calling 2023 a year ago. The, it would be the year of disappointment. I've told you guys that before. You know, The sellers weren't going to get their 21 price and the buyers weren't going to get any significant savings. Um, the, uh, thank you. Yeah. So, um, this year I came up with, I was calling it the year of incremental change. And when I would tell reporters that they were, you could just hear the pain, you know, they were disappointed that this wasn't a catchy uh, phrase. Um, so it's, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, calling it the year of less disappointment. In other words, that things are going to happen slowly this idea that um, you know, you know, one of the one of the biggest issues has been this idea that the spread between what someone has at three or four percent that they you know they earned or they obtained a property or they refied in the last four or five years versus the current rate at each increment that 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 spread tightens. You, you see a little bit more inventory coming into the market and you see a, you know, a few more buyers. Um, what we're not going to see is inventory flooding into the market, um, which would happen if rates suddenly went down to three or 4% tomorrow. Um, there's, that is not expected to happen. Um, you know, the idea here is everything's going to happen in slow motion. The volume transact of the number of transactions, I think, will will you know be a a, a fair fairly uh, higher than in 24 than 23. Um, pricing will stay about the same because inventory that comes on will be burned off as fast as um, uh, you know as it comes on by uh, lowering of rates and higher. Um, um, sort of higher demand. It's just not going to be a boom. Um, is the way it, is the way I, I we're seeing it now. The other thing to think about is, you know, there's a lot of conjecture about whether we're going to have some sort of hard recession or a soft landing at this point. And and the reason I'll tell you why this, in, at least in my mind, why this is so important is um, I think we're already in a soft landing. Um, um, you know, unemployment is still way below 4%, uh, or not way, but it's below 4%, um, yet the Fed is already saying they're going to cut rates. So that means they see weaker conditions, but uh, ahead. What, 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 what does it mean? What does it mean, a housing recession? A recession yeah. is two quarters down. What does it mean in New York or yeah. nationally? Which one are you referring to? Uh, where we're going to get a housing recession. Does that mean prices go down to so, second quarters? No, no. What it what it means, so uh, a, a, a traditional recession, forget the housing market for a, sec for a second, um, that all that matters when you think about job loss, because when you say the R word, like it's like, oh, it's this sort of the boogeyman. But I don't think any, you know, many people, including the consumer sort of process, what it means. Um, it means job loss. And uh, uh, I don't know if I've told this story before, but when I learned what a recession was um, in 2009, uh, I was in a Lord and Taylor in Stanford, Connecticut. And I was there because I wanted to buy a new suit. And it was, and I wanted to buy, and they were 50% off because, you know, it was a weak economic environment. 
So I said, hey, I'm going to buy a really expensive suit, like $800 suit for $400. Just, you know, that was what I intended. So I go to the Lord and Taylor, like on a Sunday lunchtime, and I pick out a suit. I get it fitted. It's about four, a little under $400. And um, I go to the register, and the, and the clerk r- rang it up, and uh, it was like, $43. That was what I was paying. And I said, no, no, no. You must have forgot a zero. Uh, it's 400, you know, 400 and change with tax and everything. I said, no, no, no. It's a weekend. So it, you're having another special on top of the 50 print. It's another 20. It's like, um, you know, there were like five or six other sales. And I was like, I was honestly really confused. And then I turned around and I was the only one in the store oh and chills God. went up my spine. And I said, I'm going to buy six more suits. So <laughs> I went to the rack and I ended up spending about $400 total or not because not everything was $43, but it was like, it was insane. And that's what a recession is. And I don't think that's where we're going. When you hear the R word, think of that story, you know, that they really have to prime the pump. And that's not the condition we're in. Unemployment is 3.8%. Um, you know, back then it was over 10. Uh, you know, it's sort of night and day. Um, anyway, I hope that illustrates what it felt right. like. I can still feel the shivers down my spine when I looked around and there was nobody there. There should have been a scrum where people were leaping and ripping suits off the shelves. And there wasn't any of that. Uh, oh, I was Jonathan, the only one there. Jonathan. Jonathan, uh, I they, were 10 they were ten is... percent away from telling you to just take it. Yeah, just take it. exactly. <laughs> it's a true I, story. I want to understand so, how, is, uh... how is New York different from everywhere else? The rest of the country is um, is got two is, is got no inventory, and New York is different. Right. We're hearing about yeah. what? Um, an office space crisis crisis in San yeah. Francisco, and New York is different. Um, we're, you yeah. know, I mean, so we're looking at it's, Palm Beach explosion and yet New York is different. New York is not behaving like anything else in the country. Why? Right. Because everybody is so, experiencing interest rate and seasonality. Those are not unique. Right. And interest rates are, interest rates are a national condition, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, so, so, uh, just give me, I only need five hours to answer that three part question. You only uh, get 15 but, seconds because I got to get all right, all right. Okay. Okay. So, so, uh, first, um, uh, you know, inventory, if you think about New York specifically on the inventory question, um, after the lockdown ended, uh, the suburbs and most of the country exploded in demand. It was a tsunami of demand. And part of that was at the same time, rates were really falling to, you know, historic lows. And so you had this tsunami, but that didn't happen in Manhattan. And the reason it didn't is it it was sort of known as the global hotspot for COVID. And, um, And so we didn't see activity really pick up in Manhattan until early 21, you know, like it was really like six to nine months after the rest of the world woke up. And um, because the vaccines meant that New York wasn't this dangerous place that, you know, sort of was conveyed to the world. I had a friend who was a, a, a colleague, an appraiser in West Texas, middle of nowhere. And he checked in on me, say, I was doing, you know, it's scary. You're in this global hotspot. He said, I'm in the middle of nowhere in West Texas. And, um, uh, you know, I'm so glad that won't happen here. <laughs> Three weeks later, West Texas was a global hotspot. So, but, but we're past um, COVID. We're past COVID. No, 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 no. Is- we're not. We're not past. No, we're not past. Co- we're past the impact, the initial impact. But what has happened is we were not call it nine months late to the party in terms of the explosion of, of deals and activity. And that meant that when the Fed pivoted in early 22, we were not the suburbs. The suburbs had already sort of peaked, but the city itself was really ramping up. And inventory hadn't been burned off like it had been in the suburbs yet. 
So, so the sort of in Manhattan or New York City, less so in the outer boroughs, there's sort of a hybrid between the suburbs and Manhattan. But Manhattan itself is unique in the fact that inventory levels are sort of consistent with historic norms. And that's all due to sort of we were late to the party after the, you know, sort of the release of the lockdown and the Fed pivoted in you know, the early spring of 22, um, uh, you know, to, you know, you know, raise rates and beat inflation, which they Jonathan, succeeded. That's still and here two, we are. Year, two years ago and New York is still not behaving in a rational way. The re I'm going to well, show. You, I'm going to pull up on this. It's screen. actually it's Hold actually on. functioning more normally than yes. the rest of the country because we actually have some product to sell. There is activity. There is a kind of a right. balance between buyer and seller. You know what the Do you know what the bidding war market share is right now in the the suburbs? A hundred. Uh, uh, tell me. Not a not a hundred percent. It's like feels 50%. like it most days. Yeah, it's like 50%. Do you know what it is in Manhattan right now? No. 5%. So it's 10 times more bidding wars in the suburbs than the city. Why? Because the inventory situation is completely different. And it's because we were late. Like, we're late in the cycle. Um, I want to answer... I, I, I have you to asked. remind you that the suburbs... You just said the suburbs peaked in 2020, 2021. Um, I, I just want to bring your attention to a, a fine market report here. This is showing <laughs> four suburban towns in Connecticut. See? New Canaan, Darien, Wilton, and Norwalk. And they had did not peak. They did hit a peak in 2022 here. And then they hit another one in 2023. And then they went further uh, right here at I, the I, end of 2023. Is that price? What is what is I, that measuring? Yeah, yeah that is that, median, okay, so, that's median yeah. sales price across four well, different towns at four different price points. You're talking so, about price. I know, this is, a, about I, know this, is a, I know this is an attempt to show your beautiful charts. And they, <laughs> the, it's great, except... It's it's all about transaction volume, not price. That's what I use peak. I, I wasn't clear. That's what I'm talking about. And um, I just want to make one other point on the New York is different than everybody else comment that you made when we talk about the commercial, you know, the office market there. I think there's a 60 minutes uh, 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 story coming up this weekend. Um, uh, they've been they've been sharing it on uh, social media. Um, is like, and, and it's this big question, like you, you've had like, uh, you know, high prices and, uh, you know, before the rate spiked, um, you know, the rental market peaked in the summer and yet you have like the highest vacancy in history, um, in New York with the office buildings. And it's, and it's more about like class B and C and then maybe the lower half of class A, class upper half of class A, not it, not it really impacted. Why is that? How can we have that? And it's because, and this is not unique to the country, most urban markets have very low vacancy. Um, right now, you know, uh, New York City is sort of at 50%, if you believe the castle data. Um, if you look at Rebney's report, I think it's like 70% or 75% using, um, I can't remember the name of the firm, but it's using like um, uh, uh, trying to think of the the technology. Anyway, it's called Placer.ai. They're using like pedestrian traffic on the street, that kind of thing. Um, but anyway, you look at it, it's a lot lower, and it's not gonna, you know, work from home isn't going away. So it's not that New York is looking at some devastating commercial cycle in the sense that it's going to change New York City forever. I think what's going to happen is over the next three to five years, you're going to have a lot of uh, landlords go under in B and C property because they can't lower their prices on office leasing to the market rate because they have debt service and the debt service they, you know, unless they want to default sooner than later, they're waiting. And um, and I know this because I, you know, I went through a search. That is a way that New York is different 
from most other markets. I have to say that the underlying debt and the debt service uh, uh, is is a factor weighing on the New York market, or at least affecting the New York market that is not affecting the highly fragmented ownership structure in say Connecticut, where everybody owns their, you know, for, for the most part, we yeah. own our own homes here. Most of those are rented in the city. Those are rental driven, income driven properties. There's underlying debt uh, on the entire building that's affecting your market in a way it's not affecting ours. Would you say that's true? I think the way, I, uh, to a certain degree, I think urban markets across the U.S. are sort of experiencing many sort of versions of what's happening in Manhattan. Manhattan gets all the attention because it's the biggest uh, office market in the country. And um, and I think that if you look at it, that you're going to see a lot of buildings, you know, sort of the, the B and C, go into stronger hands as the landlords default. And then the new owners will be able to charge market rates. And you're going to have a lot of companies that were priced out of New York come in. Like it's, it's not well, I re- like I read we're going to have week, a- and, and even, and I don't even pay attention to that market. And even I read about Barney's, the former Barney's space uh, was foreclosed on resold last week for like pennies on the dollar, like, $25 million or something ridiculous. I mean, I feel like we could pool our money and go buy the old Barney's building. Yeah. And the guy's got plans to build like, you know, a hundred luxury condos there. And I thought, yeah, that's an example of strong money coming in after a, a, a very sad period in that building's life. Is that happening all over New York? Uh, it's a little early. And the reason it's a little early is because a lot of these spaces you know, if you if you're a landlord with 50 percent of your office space still under le- under tenancy from leases that were signed prior to the pandemic, you're not feeling the full pain yet. Um, you know, of you know rents being you know rents are being at sort of pre work from home levels. Um, so I think this is a gradual process over the next you know three to five five to seven years. Um, and it's not going to cause a banking crisis. You know, lending standards were pretty good. Banks are pretty collateralized. I don't think we're going to see a banking crisis like we saw during the financial crisis. Credit conditions since the financial crisis have been tighter than historic norms, and they got even tighter when rates went up. Um, what's interesting now on the residential side is credit is easing pretty quickly, I think, you know, at the one of the fastest paces, and I'm not saying it's, you know, becoming, you know, market of liar loans and all that kind of stuff that we saw um, at one point, uh, you know, 15 years ago or so. Um, but that's good for you know, home buyers in the sense that credit is starting to ease, at least according to the Fed. All right, Roberto, I need a reason on this. Now that we've been talking economics, you know, at a high level for a a while, and I try and put a picture on it when we look at Barney's, but um, if if I'm a a regular guy in New York, I've been told that for the first time in years, I can buy a two-bedroom condo in Midtown for under a million dollars. And they said, uh, this is not a normal phenomenon. These are not normal times. They said the fact that you can buy a studio or a one bedroom and maybe even a two bedroom, those prices have come down uh, versus where they were, five, say, five years ago. And you have an incredible opportunity. Is that true? No, no, I don't think I don't <laughs> think prices have come down like that at all. And I wanted to ask, no, in fact- getting back to pricing, because I want to I want to go back to we exchanged an email, the three of us prior. And you had because you had stated the prices were at record highs. Now, we I was at- thinking about rent, rent, record rents. Rents peaked, peaked like all time high in the probably Maybe. late summer. Uh, August. Yeah. 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 And so yeah. I was thinking, wait a minute, I, I didn't make up record prices. I mean, you know, when 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 you guys hit a record in New York, you guys, you know, pick up the look at the closest megaphone and let everybody know. And m- some of us missed the memo that those rents were off a little bit since uh, August. But um, but so yeah. you got to. But, you, you but can't so I'm, for but, thinking but, it's a record so every ask- day. 
I want to ask Jonathan about this because we were, let's say we were at 2019, we were at a certain level. COVID happened, we dropped. And then as by 2020, you know, end of 2021, beginning of 2022, we kind of got back to 2019 levels. And then absolutely, the interest, then interest rates came. And since then, we've kind of deflated a bit. And I said that I thought from a standpoint of price per square foot, that prices are down eight, nine, maybe 10-ish percent. And you said in the email, you said, but not in aggregate. What did you mean by that? So like the, you know, what John was listing apartments under a million dollars, two bedrooms, you know, I'm talking in, you know, terms of median and average, mainly median or price per foot. And, um, and so, you know, what, what you had in the rental market was you had rents peaking in the summer, um, all time highs. And uh, then I love that you're showing charts at the same time. This is awesome. Um, and, Keeping uh, you honest. and, no, no, I appreciate it. Um, and you're right. You know, median rent has come off, but it's still about 15% above pre-pandemic levels, which would be uh, the, you know, it'd be December of 19 versus uh, the December of 23. Rents are, rents are still up 15.7% over pre-pandemic levels. Um, so in, you know, in this four-year window, um, rents rose almost 16% or 4% a year, which is, um, you know, a big number for people that are paying, you know, the, these kind of numbers. Rents have actually fallen almost 10% from the peak. Um, but even after falling 10%, they're still 16% above pre-pandemic. So rents are elevated, but they're coming down. And I suspect that the first half of this year, as the economy slows down and unemployment maybe rises a tad, that we're going to see rents somewhere between stabilize or slip, but they're not going to correct, I, I, I don't believe. Um, on the pricing side, the sale price, oh. Just Wait, that, that on line the rental, on the chart is going up or it's just going to be flat? It's going to, it's going to be less steep downward, if not sideways, somewhere in between mm -hmm. that. Um, and to make, to sort of to jump on to what Roberto had said about when the Fed started raising rates in early 22, the rental market began this massive ascent in prices because people that were sort of on the fence on the purchase market or want to wait and see how it plays out, they jumped into the rental market and made an, an, a, a relatively tight market incredibly tight. And we saw this sort of rocket ship that you had on your chart, but that wasn't, unsus that wasn't sustainable. And in fact, in the summer, I think the reason why rents kind of, you know, peaked and then began dropping, you know, mortgage rates, uh, you know, there was no announcement by the fed in July or August. Um, I think it's just the market hit some sort of affordability threshold where consumers just couldn't pay anymore. And landlords are starting to recognize it for you know, technical reasons in the data, you can see that new leases fell, but that's only because renewals increased because landlords are being more aggressive um, in the summer to retain tenants. They saw the future and the future suggested lower rents. Um, in the purchase market, it's funny, uh, rents are purchase price, the median price year over year is actually up 5.1%. The first time in about five quarters that aggregate, meaning everything in one bucket went up, um, you know, of course. Year over the, year? You can, year over year? Year over year. Year over year. And prices, median price, it's a million, 150 and change, is like almost exactly the same as the rental price of our pre-pandemic. It's about 15.8% or called 16% higher than pre-pandemic. So, you know, what we've learned from the in the pandemic era, what we've learned is that really low interest rates make housing much more expensive and uh, because it obliterates inventory. And, um, and so, you know, we've had that, that's where this upper price pressure in many markets has come from. 
far more pressure outside of Manhattan because of the severe lack of inventory. Okay, I want to stop talking about interest rates. I, I, I want to switch gears and tackle it, tackle it from another perspective. There's been a lot of uh, headlines and talk about the migration of wealth out of New York City, Connecticut, and other high tax states to low tax states. There's uh, you know, a lot of charts in the housingnotes.com uh, talking about where people are going and why. And a lot of that reason is cited as being tax tax driven and and to a lesser extent weather driven. Why do people go to the Carolinas, Florida, Texas? Taxes is one reason, weather is another. Um, can we talk about where are New Yorkers uh, selling and going to and where are they coming from and why? Because I was hearing right. that tech was a big driver of the New York housing market and that the, the investment by tech, Facebook, Amazon, uh, Google, Apple, uh, Microsoft, all in New York in the last five years ha is having and will continue to have an effect on the housing market. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think if you read the news during the lockdown, uh, you know, you were pretty sure there were going to be 11 people left in New York City by the by the fall. Like they're just it was just like, you know, headlines in air quotes like, you know, f fleeing the city, uh, you know, just that whole sort of hyperbole. And um, first of all, uh, it, it's fascinating, too, because depending on what news source you read, get you know there's a there's a range of extremes from oh it was nothing or oh everybody's leaving right and um the fact is that the census data during the um pandemic stunk it was really bad like they they had problems right door to door and all that uh, you know re people replying because they you know to the to the questionnaires and they had moved out of town for four months or whatever um, it was a disaster. And so there's been a lot of sort of back end, uh, you know, relook at it. And and um, the narrative that everybody moved to Florida is significantly overstated, even though lots of people moved to Florida. But it gives the impression you, you take that with the impression that no one moved to New York. And that's not true. We had a lot of inbound migration. In fact, um, in the latest census data, which is, uh, you know, a suspect or less suspect in, you know, the 21 to 22, it's the 21 data, 2021 data was really bad. But in the 22 data, uh, you know, it's too soon for 23, um, it actually showed that Manhattan had a net positive migration for the first time since the pandemic began. There are actually more people coming in than going out. Um, and in the outer boroughs, there was a significantly smaller outbound migration, meaning that just a little bit more than people when it moved out that came in. And there's every reason to think that in the next year or two um, that we're going to get that. You said sort of net migration in in Manhattan was up and uh, up modestly in the outer boroughs. Uh, I was saying it was up in Manhattan and it was down modestly. But it was severe, you know, the year before because 2020 to 21 was when the sort of the outbound really peaked. Um, but Manhattan actually turned around quicker. And the reason it turned around is because, you know, all those people that sort of camped out in the suburbs or moved to the Hamptons um, came back. And the reason they came back is because they're, you know, the, the people that left were more the more affluent. And the more affluent you are, the more mobile you are in theory. That, and, that's uh, part Manhattan of the context. That's part of the context is that a lot of the people who left, what they did was they didn't sell their properties. They didn't leave in the sense they le left their presence in New York. They just reassigned. It's more of a tax losing of a tax base because they reassigned their primary residences to other places. It's not like we've had a right. flood of inventory because everybody's selling. They're just at these affluent people are just adding another house or moving their resident, their primary residence to a different place. So they're not paying taxes here. And that's been a lot of the flight of these people. Like that's part of the context and the texture of that. Yep. 
I I very much agree. What I hear you saying is New yep. York is not in crisis, but that doesn't mean that a great deal of people aren't going to Florida and spending at least 50 percent of their time there or to Texas. Or yeah, to Florida. Lines. And like the like the map shows, Florida and Texas, you know, very low tax locations. California is having the same challenges, Illinois as well, um, uh, clearly. But it gives the impression that no one's here. And and that is not the story. In fact, um, but, but uh, Jonathan, yeah, they, even I, if they even if they're still there and maintaining their New York apartment and we can say uh, nothing to see here, move along, you know, everything's just fine. Yeah. This building is fully occupied. A lot of those people are not, in fact, there as much spending the money they were driving the New York economy. We, I don't think Correct. that we should talk say that just because they haven't moved full time to Florida, that we don't have a potential problem here. We, we, well, we do, we absolutely do have a potential problem. I guess what I'm trying to do, I'm not sugarcoating it. What I'm trying to do is that it is a problem, but it's not as significant as what was sort of sort of laid out, uh, you know, two over the you know two years ago, call it. Um, currently, you know, about fifty-one, uh, a little over fifty percent of New York City's tax revenue comes from real estate um, in in many forms, and um, and so uh, you know, and real estate has been you know uh, hit like everybody else has been by interest rates, um, not by lack of inventory, but by interest rates. And I think, um, you know, the city, you know, this is going to be the problem, right? It's really hard to cut services and we don't want this to be a failure spiral. Um, but, you know, the, the sort of the idea, the scale of like Wall Street moving to Florida is not real. Uh, it, it is certainly Florida's getting tech uh, you know, you know, uh, Citadel and, you know, some bold face names in the securities industry have moved there. But in the in the context of the entire industry, it is, you know, the image of like everybody moved is just simply incorrect. Um, uh, and, and that's all I'm trying to do. I'm trying to like level the field. If you, you know, depending on the publication you read, everybody's got a different take on it. And, and most of it is either too high or too low. Looking towards the end of the year, like toward, John, do you, Jonathan, do you anticipate, we do anticipate because of increased deal volume. I mean, deal volume, I think was down like 27% from the year prior last year. We're going to get yeah. a lot more deal volume and we should see prices start to gravitate upwards, right? Yeah, I think, I think so. Because not only that, um, you know, the Fed's talking about three rate cuts starting in the middle of the year, May, May, June, you know, sometime in the back half of the second quarter. Um, and 75 basis points is what Powell said out loud, um, which based on 25 basis points moves, you know, in the past, that suggests three rate cuts in the second half of the year. But there's also, you know, I'm reading a lot of economists are talking about three more cuts in the first half of 25. So what's really interesting, and this is sort of touches on what John was saying in the beginning, is this whole concept of housing recession uh, versus economic recession. And so while real estate agents for the last two years have seen less volume as an industry, um, largely because of the, uh, the spike in rates at a, a very steep ascent, um, it feels like a recession, right? It, it's not, not technically a recession. A housing recession, it just feels like it because transaction volume is so low. But what has made it really confusing is that prices haven't corrected in a significant way because inventory, because of the sharp ascent of rates, um, have kept owners from listing their properties. On the other hand, at the same time, you know, the industry is feeling, you know, this, this, a significant slowdown, the overall economy sort of above it, the bigger part of the economy, not much bigger, but bigger, it's been very, it's very, very strong economically. Wage growth. Let, let is me, pa much let me pause you. 
Let me pause you. We got 30 seconds left. We can come back to that thought. But I want to thank you, Jonathan Miller of MillerSamuel.com. I want to thank Roberto Cabrera. Bye. You'll find him at RobertoCabrera.com, where you'll read his end-of-year market report. I want to remind everybody we'll be back next week for episode 121, Beyond the Sale, Life You Love on Bros and Burbs. Like us, share us, spread the word. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for a great uh, I, I learned a lot. I learned that we're gonna we're in a normal period, a balanced period in New York, and that's gonna continue. Thanks, gentlemen. All right. All right, we're clear. Carry, we're on, that, carry on that thought, Jonathan. Thanks, Miller. Aaron. Was that in fact true? Uh, Are we in normal? And I know it doesn't sell newspapers, it does not sell podcasts to say it, but this is gonna be a boring a boring year in New York in 2024. I'm not going to hear words like record setting rentals. I'm not going to hear John, horrid pace. John, you're going to have to really, you're going to have to start to aspire to have normalcy because what we learned in this last cycle is that, you know, we've been on this crazy roller coaster, right? And it's very exhausting. Um, the Fed, in my view, really screwed up. And, uh, and held rates too low for too long. And we created this frenzy and now we're coming out of it. And the coming out part is multiple years. And we're probably, you know, we're, you know, two years into the coming out party. Uh, if I'm uh, a and, realtor, and... if I'm a realtor, normal does not impart a sense of urgency on either my sellers who are waiting um, until prices get better or my buyers who are waiting for interest rates to fall and everybody waiting around because tomorrow is not going to be substantially different from today. That's not good it, for it's realtors. Weird to, How's volume going to do? It, well, volume's going to be higher, but not a frenzy. Um, John, you've got to learn to be more positive. I, you know, I feel like our roles have reversed. Um the reason why I say that is because um, uh, you have, think of a consumer, the consumers that were ready to buy in the first half of 2022. They've been waiting for two years and it's still not, rates aren't still low enough for many of them. By 80% uh, uh, of people with a mortgage have a rate of 5% or less. Um, and so as rates fall, more and more people tip back in, especially with the knowledge. Think about it. I mean, to exaggerate, to make my point, you know, Roberto gets a call from, you know, a couple that has a one bedroom apartment and they just had triplets 18 months ago. Um, and they're just dying, you know, like people, their life circumstances, they've been waiting for a couple of years. It's not like, you know, you, I understand your point, like, hey, there's no sense of urgency. But I think there is a sense of urgency for people that have been waiting for, you know, a couple of years when they were ready to go, um, you know, in 2022 and were not able to or were afraid to. Um, that, that's I, my point. I, I have a client uh, who's I, been waiting I, and he's been renting. And I thought he should be showing a great sense of urgency now. But you know what? Prices went up since he was looking and interest rates went yeah. up and he's waiting for that recession that everybody keeps talking about. He's waiting for yeah. that correction. And I keep telling him it ain't coming. We're not getting yeah, that now. correction. He missed the boat. And that's the whole, that's the, ur the ur urgency. It's more of a protracted urgency that if you don't buy now in a year, two years, it's going to be more, Prices it's going to be more expensive. Prices, so nationally, you can see nationally, you know, uh, prices are rising. And and uh, in many markets, prices are not quite at what they were in like late 21 or 22, but they're, they likely over the next six months before the Fed does anything, I, I wouldn't be surprised, especially when you have 50% of the market share bidding wars, in the New York suburbs, that prices will um, return to sort of um, pre-Fed pivot levels. So the reality is, you know, normally, you know, your buyer, or I'm sorry, your potential buyer is is like, 
hey, you know, a negative event, this is an opportunity to buy cheap because sales are going to slow, inventory is going to pile to the sky. And, uh, and so it, the world becomes much more competitive and I'm going to buy at a discount. So it's smart. The thing is, is that when sales dropped, inventory didn't pile to the sky nationwide. And, and so this scenario is different. And that's what agents should be sort of pushing, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, talking to clients is that this is not the normal sort of ebb and flow of supply and demand because of the steep ascent of mortgage rates. And even as they come down, they're still not going to come down fast enough to cause inventory to flood into the market and see prices drop based on what we know now. You know, who knows? No one saw the pandemic coming, right? Um, or at least I didn't. But, um, uh, you know, so, we don't, you know, you can always have a black swan event. You can't anticipate. But, you know, hey, uh, you know, who, know, who knows? Um, I, I find you know, from personal experience and just from, you know, all of our analysis that sort of timing the market like a club, you know, like this clever potential buyer you're talking about is, um, a mis is mistaken. But, um, and you can see it because he missed, you know, prices are higher now. Who would have so, thought, you, who would so have my, thought 10 years so the ago? Advice, so the advice for my 27, my 26 year old twins uh, one's out in LA <laughs> and the other's in New York. Um, for them to go borrow money at six and a half percent, seven percent, and go buy housing, housing would have to be appreciating um, for the next several years. Do you expect? Um, I mean, and they've got a long horizon, not like me, not like yeah. Roberto. Are you advising those 26 year olds <laughs> to buy? in these markets or is it not, not a sure thing? It's not a sure thing. I don't advise anybody, by the way, I just wax on poetically about the market and some people take notes, but uh, I do look at this idea that, um, you know, I think people should be looking. And I remember this during the financial crisis, everybody's looking at, you know, stock market as, or the housing market is the stock market. And we learned from that, that it's a long-term asset. It's not a short-term asset. Um, I, I hope and pray that we have continued sanity in the housing market, that it's boring. But you um, think a deficit nationally of 10 million homes or more, which isn't getting corrected, means good long-term, I've heard you say, well, good long-term prospects for price appreciation in the real estate market. And as long as they buy well and intelligently, um, buying real estate is a good long-term play. I'm hearing you say that as we've come out of a period of crisis and correction um, and even interest rate manipulation, uh, I heard words like normal. And now I, and I hear that we're not solving the national inventory problem for any time, anytime soon. Correct. And, and actually, I think that uh, you know, if you look at inventory uh, in the context of existing and, and new construction, um, you know, historically, the ratio has been like 90-10 or 85-15, um, usually, you know, on a local level or national level. And so, uh, you know, I think the, the outsized growth of inventory, if you, if you hope for that, you know, in more inventory, more choices, um, you know, less price appreciation is going to come out of new construction um, much more reliably than existing for the next, you know, five, 10 years, I would think. Um, rates have to go drop really low to have inventory really come into the market. And I just don't see that happening. I do see rates lower. You know, my wild guess on rates in the long term. I think a normal rate is five and a half to six percent long term. And I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if that's where you end up after all this. The 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 hoping and wishing for two and if two uh two or three percent is just going to make housing even more expensive. Um we've already proven that. Roberto, you want the final word? I just say I 
I agree with virtually everything Jonathan's saying, except that I do feel that it's going to be a little deal volume is going to be a little more, more robust than he's leading on. I don't think it's going to be a frenzy, but I think it's going to be strong. Why? I th the pent up demand life happens. A lot of people who have these mortgages, they're not all on 30 year fixed. Some of them are on five year, 10 year arms and they need them. They need to make a change anyway. And uh, it and the sentiment, it's just a matter of sentiment changes. And I've seen so many market cycles in New York. The moment the sentiment starts to change, it really just turns and it starts going in a different direction. And I think we're kind of at that point. Do you think really we're going do. from meh to uh, ooh, uh, we're going we're like, like, like let's, where people let's, pay let's get in. Okay. Let's get in. Let's look. Let's see what's out there. All right. John, thank great. you. Yeah, as always. Yeah, thank you guys. You always Jonathan, drain you me so emotionally much. when I do these calls. I'm just heavily <laughs> drained emotionally after I talk to you both. It's always it's always helpful. I can see it on your face. You're not you're not used to being <laughs> challenged. You're not used to being challenged like this. Like you put up a housing chart and you're like, that's the way it is. And uh, instead, yeah. you get Roberto and I going, eh, not so fast. What does that mean? Listen, you listen. You forget the fact that I raised four sons, and I was always wrong. So I'm used to that. Uh, anyway, all right. Good to Thank see you, you guys. Thank you so much. Jonathan. Always a pleasure. Sorry for the technical. Take see care. See you next week. Bye bye. bye. No Good to see you, Johnny.